from the book of Job. Job said to the Lord, I had heard of you by the hearing of my ear, but now my eye sees you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Well, good morning, friends. You know, I can't help but hear that hymn, and I have <laughs> such a funny story. I was the rector of Trinity Church in Red Bank, New Jersey, where I was for six years before I got here. And Gracie, my daughter, was probably, I don't know, seven or eight years old. And as I'm coming down at the final recession, she's standing on the pew like this, with a total, like, you know, anger on her face. And I said, Gracie, what's wrong? And she said, Daddy, first you talk about me in your sermon, and then you write a song about me. Amazing grace. I'm like, yeah, it's not quite that way, my dear. Anyhow, it's a good, I always think of that every single time. Anyway, here's a question for today. On to more important matters. Here's a question for today. If you could ask God, if you could ask the Lord any question, what would it be? If you could ask him anything at all, what would it be? It's probably something which worries you, which is why I asked the question, actually. But what would, if you could ask God anything right now, what would it be? Who will win the election, right? What should I do to be a better father or mother or husband or wife? What really is the difference between an alligator and a crocodile? The great mysteries of mankind. Well, honestly, if you could ask God anything at all, what would it be? Well, today we actually read an account, it's not obvious, but you'll see it when I get to it, of a guy named Job who had this exact opportunity to ask God anything at all, to see God face to face and ask him the most pressing question he could think of. If you had that chance, what would you ask him? Three things I'm going to look at today with this story of Job about meeting God. Because Job, this is the conclusion of the book of Job. Chapter 42 is the end of the book. And at the end of the book of Job, we see some really, really cool stuff. The conclusion of the matter of the story of Job. And the most important thing is where Job actually meets God. It's incredible. Three points today. Point number one, God meets Job. Point number two, God challenges Job. Point number three, God restores Job. Point number one, God meets Job. Point number two, God challenges Job. Point number three, God restores him. So, little background. If you weren't here last week, I talked about this. The book of Job, I've only preached it for two weeks, but it's 38 chapters. And the book of Job is essentially about this question, which is as follows. God, why me. I didn't get into this last week, but it's really the question of what's known as theodicy. That's a, definitely a Jeopardy question right there. But the question is this, really the question that Job asks, and we've all asked this question before, why do bad things happen to good people? Why me, Lord? Why do bad things happen to good people? We've all wondered that question. We've all had bad things happen to us and asked ourselves, why do bad things happen to good people? But if you think about it for a minute and you dig down a level, you dig down to the assumptions that you make in that question, you see two things. Why do bad things happen to good people? There's two assumptions in that question that I want to challenge you with. A, that people are good, and B, that the world is fair. When you say, why do bad things happen to good people, God? You're actually assuming two things, that people are good and that the world is fair. And friends, neither of those assumptions is true. Despite the enlightenment idea of the, the tabula rasa, right? The blank slate, that we're born little cute babies that are just innocent and pure, and it's not until the world kicks us in the pants that we become bitter. We believe that, and it's totally false. I will submit to you, you will never meet a more self-centered, narcissistic, short-tempered, temperamental person than a newborn. <laughs> Newborns are the most difficult. Could you imagine if we stayed the same way all the way through? N newborn children are the most difficult people to be around, if you think about it, which thankfully is why God makes them so cute. <laughs> but the reason bad things happen to good people, friends, is not because 
the world is good and somehow fair. No, the point is, of course, that the reason bad things happen is because we live in a fallen and broken world. Our Lord Jesus says this himself in Matthew 5, 45. We are fallen people living in a fallen world because the rain falls on the just and the unjust. So this question of why me is actually a loaded question. There's a lot of assumptions that come to pass with that question. But the interesting thing is that God actually allows Job to ask it. This might be the most important point of the entire book. Not the answer to the question, but the fact that God allows the question to be asked in the first place. God, why me? And we saw last week, two things happen when Job asks that question. Firstly, God listens to him, which is astounding. And secondly, God reminds Job of an important fact, which we all need to be reminded of from time to time, that he is God and that Job and me and you are not. Job, I'm God and you are not. Sounds like God pulling rank. I talked about this last week. You can watch it on the website. But in other words, you might say, Job, God says to Job, Job, you cannot control these things, but I can. And I love you, and I hear you. And after all that, that goes on, this, back, this dialogue between God and Job, and after God basically says, Job, I hear you, I'm God, and you're not, we see what happens this morning in chapter 42, which is actually the conclusion of the matter. Point number one, God meets Job. After God tells Job, Job, I'm God and you are not, Job actually sees God face to face. Imagine what that even is. It's not even described. It says it me, that God met, met, met Job in the whirlwind, whatever that means. I don't even know what that means, actually. But somehow God and Job meet face to face. And Job says, verse 2, it's right there. He says this, I know, God, that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. And then the money line in verse 5, I have heard of you by the ear. I'd heard about you, but now I see you, but now my eyes see you. You know, I think until this point in the story, it's so cool. I think until this point in the story, Job, who's a faithful guy, he's referred to as a faithful guy, he loves God, but I think Job, like probably most of us at this, in our lives on this earthly voyage here, God is more of a concept than a reality. Even if we believe in God and love him, which we all do, I hope, otherwise you probably wouldn't be here. But to actually see God face to face, man, mano to mano, right? It changes everything and it actually undoes Job. It undoes him. Let me ask you this. Have you ever been undone? What do you mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is, have you ever experienced something in your life where all the things you leaned on and relied upon to make your life make sense and hold together and it all falls apart? Have you ever come undone? And it could be lots of things, right? A series of events you didn't plan for, the death of a loved one, the loss of a job, the death of a child, God forbid, Failing health, the list goes on. We've all been there. My point, friends, is that at some point in your life, you and I will become undone when we are confronted by the things in this world which we cannot solve. All the things we relied on, money, fame, power, success, reputation, all of it fails us. But let me submit this to you, that being undone can be a tremendous blessing. In his book, uh, Walking with God, and this is a great book, Walking with God Through Pain and Suffering. Tim Keller, we did a study on it. It's on the website if you want to check it out. Um, Tim Keller's got a great book called Walking with God Through Pain and Suffering. He says, when people are undone, undone, when the bottom falls out, there's two reactions. It can either push us away from God or it can draw us closer. And, and, And I'll be honest, in my own heart, sometimes it's both at the same time. I'll tell you, I've seen both. People who suffer, and it makes them bitter and resentful and angry. Turn on the news, man. (laughs) 
but I've also seen people, and you have too, that suffer and experience joy, not in the suffering, of course, unless you're some kind of sociopath, but I mean, you re they receive joy as a result of the struggle because, because when you are undone, it makes you realize, listen, how short and how tenuous life is. Job meets God, meets him face to face, and it undoes him. And the question, why me, fades away. Let me give you an example. Let me tell you about a guy I know. I don't actually know him personally, but I've read about him a lot. A guy named Thomas Aquinas, St. Thomas Aquinas, 13th century priest, Franciscan. Thomas Aquinas was, in my mind, the smartest man whom ever lived, smarter than Elon Musk, right? And that dude's smart. He Thomas Aquinas was so brilliant that he could actually lecture, and people would take notes on what he was saying, to six or seven different secretaries, amanuensis is the word, but he would write to these people, and they'd be taking notes on seven, six or seven different topics at the same time. On things like the creation of the universe. How can, you know, all sorts of stuff. Big, thick, meaty stuff. If you've ever read any Aquinas, you know the dude was brilliant. Anyway, one of the sharpest minds who ever lived, at one point, Thomas Aquinas had what's known as a theophany. He met God face to face. He never describes it. It's indescribable. But what happened next fascinates me. Thomas Aquinas meets God face to face. This God that he'd written about for tomes and tomes of books. And the minute he sees God, you know what he does? He puts down his pen, and he says the following. Ready? All that I have written is straw. When you meet God face to face, you are undone. All the why me's of this world vanish. You know why? Because when you meet God, and you will someday, God willing, your life will come into such incredible focus that the questions you had in this life will no longer matter. Paul says this very thing on the night before he was executed. Paul writes this, you know, not why me. This is what Paul writes. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12. For now we, us, see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. For now I know in part, Paul says, but then I shall know in full, even as I am fully known. So let me just say this before I move on to point number two. This idea of meeting God, be encouraged in that, because someday you will meet him, and it will either repulse you or, rem or draw you in so much that you will never, the things you worry about now, you won't even remember what they were. People will say to me a lot of times, do you think cats go to, dogs go to heaven, for example? I don't know. But I also say, when you get there, you're not going to care. Keep your eyes on the big picture, friends. The things of this world are transient. The things you and I worry about now really don't matter from an eternal perspective. That's my first point. God meets Job, and it undoes him. But the second thing I want you to see here is that God meets Job, and it challenges him. Remember, Job is about the question, why me, right? But, his, but Job's got some friends, right? And they're not very good friends. It's, if you know the book of Job, there's 38 chapters worth of Job complaining and Job's friends complaining about him. So Job asks, why me? And his friends say, Job, why you? What have you done to deserve this, you filthy animal? What are you not telling us, Job? What have you done that's so bad, so horrible, that God would do this to you? And Job says, I'm, not, I'm clean, man. I got nothing. Job, you're a liar. I'm telling you the truth. I'm not lying. I did nothing wrong. And they accuse him. Job, why you? You ever had someone made a, make a false accusation against you? I have. You ever had someone say something about you that was so terrible that no matter what you said, nobody would believe you because the charges were just so outrageous. 
Remember the reason we ask why me in the first place? It's that we get a sense of control so that we can be God in our own minds. If I know what I did wrong, that I can avoid it. Well, it's the same thing with what did you do? If I know what you did wrong, then I can be smarter than you were. Then I can not make the same stupid mistakes you made. Psychologists call this blaming the victim. It's super common in sexual assaults, by the way. Well, you know, if she hadn't been wearing that short dress, maybe she wouldn't have gotten herself in trouble. If she hadn't had so much beer at a frat party, maybe she'd have been better. You see my point, right? Everybody does it. Job's friends do this to him. Job, why you? What have you done? It's your fault. And if you've been falsely accused, you know how hard it is to forgive. Same with Job. Same with Job. 38 chapters of Job here and his friends just beat him up. He's angry. He's frustrated until Job meets God. I'll prove it to you. Job meets God. The Lord is angered. Job, Job, the Lord is angered at these three friends of Job's that have been accusing him falsely. And God says to these, men, these friends, quote, friends like that who needs enemies, right? God says, to these three friends, take seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job and offer up a burnt offering for yourselves. And my servant Job, listen to this, shall pray for you. So Eliphaz and Big Dad, Baldad and Zophar did what the Lord told them and the Lord accepted Job's prayer. Isn't that something? Here's Job, the innocent victim, becomes Job, the advocate for the guilty. It's a total typology of Jesus on the cross. Job, the man who suffered blame and reproach falsely, prays for his enemies. Why would a man do that? Because you're supposed to, Father. It's the right thing to do. Well, there's more to it than that, you see, because Job, Job has learned something critically important. Job has learned that God is God and he is not. And Job has learned that even though he's got all of this anger and bitterness in his heart, God will be the one who visits justice. It's not Job's responsibility to make the world to rights. It is not Job's responsibility to make justice to bear. Job's responsibility is to be faithful. Because God, Job saw the big picture that it is God who punishes, and punishes injustice and not Job. Anybody here ever have a hard time forgiving somebody? Nah, never. It's easy, right? You ever had a hard time forgiving someone? You all have. We've all been there. We've all, we've all got people that we have hurt us, and maybe we still carry it. Okay. Take a lesson from Job that first realize that God has forgiven you and secondly, realize that vengeance is not your job, but God's. And your job then really is to pray for them to come to a place of repentance so that they do not bear the penalties of their own sin. I have people that have wronged me big time in my own life. And sometimes I, if I sit there and think to myself, you know what? No matter how badly someone has wronged me, I could never wish someone to be in hell. And when you come at it from that angle, that God's job is the one who serves justice, you can pray for people genuinely and sincerely because you want them to come to a place of repentance like you have. So God meets Job and he undoes him. God meets Job and he challenges Job to forgive his adversaries, which Job does. And then finally, God meets Job and restores him. So after all the suffer, suffering and struggle, after Job had wrestled with God and wrestled with Job's friends, after, God, after the bottom has fallen out, verse 12, the Lord restores Job. And it says here, the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than the beginning. Job's wealth is restored. He's, God gives him more land, more wealth. He gives him 6,000 camels, what in the world do you do with 6,000 camels? I have no idea. But whatever you do with them, he's got 6,000 of them. But the point is that all of, in all of Job's struggles, 
listen to this. This is, a, this is instructive for you and me. In all of Job's struggles, you see, he ends up in a better place after the struggle than when he started. I'm going to repeat that. Realize in Job's story that he, he winds up in a better place after his struggle than he did when he started. And that's true for you, too. We all know the Christian life is a life of joy and a life of struggle, a life of suffering and sometimes victory, a life of being falsely accused and being made righteous and vindicated. We've all been there. We've all done that. But in the end, think about it like this. In the end, the Christian life is a life of victory because in the end, you and I will meet God. And as faithful Christians, you and I will be resurrected from the dead and be restored beyond anything you can possibly imagine. I love the last verse of Job. I'm not even really sure what it means, but it occurs four times in Scripture, Abraham, in the book of Chronicles, and it occurs here, and I'm going to read it to you. I think I want this on my tombstone. The last verse of Job says, And Job died, an old man and full of years. It's a Jewish idiom. I don't really know exactly what it means, but this is what I think it means. Job died an old man and full of years. In other words, Job, di- Job lived a life like all of ours, victory and defeat, suffering and joy. And in all of it, at the end of his life, he dies, but he lived a life of fullness and victory. A life full of years. See, my friends, the the book of Job teaches us the blessing of persistence and the blessing of confidence that even when things seem at their darkest, even when things seem completely hopeless, God is with us. God is with you. And that life really is nothing more. Life on this side of the divide is really nothing more than a pregame show and a testing ground for the life to come. Let me say that again. Life in this world is a testing and a pregame for the world and the life that is to come, for the next life with Jesus. And in that life, all shall be restored and all shall be renewed. And in that, friends, is where we place our hope, and in that is where we get and live in our encouragement. I'm going to leave you with Paul, St. Paul's famous words. St. Paul, of course, one of the best evangelist of the Christian faith. His famous words the night before he was executed. And it wasn't why me, it was this. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. Paul writes, at the end of his life, on the night before his execution, Timothy, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Listen to this. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me, and not only to me, but on all who have loved him. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for Job, who shows us how to suffer well, who reminds us of the big picture. Lord, help the suffering in our lives to make us undone and redo us in your image. Remind us, Lord, of the big picture, that we can stand ready and fearless knowing that we will see you someday face to face and all the worries of this world will fade away. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.